Bishop Barron recently released a YouTube sermon in which he discussed the lesser lights of truth that are in false religions or non-Christian religions. And Bishop Barron asked the question, can people find salvation by means of these lesser lights? And Bishop Barron answers, yes. Now, his answer is nuance. And in its conclusion, and primarily in its application, it leads to a message that is actually contrary to the teaching of Jesus Christ in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then also the very passage that Bishop Barron was preaching on, Acts 4, 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. So it is true that other religions contain truth. I'm going to go into that a little bit later. I'm going to give some examples. But because there's truth in non-Christian religions, can those religions, those philosophies, those worldviews, can they become the means of salvation? So today I'm going to try to isolate the distinction and where Bishop Barron should adjust and change the way he talks about that. Because if he doesn't, he will continue to affirm what he said in that interview with Ben Shapiro, where Bishop Barron said that Christ is the privileged way. Not the only way, not the divine way. He's the privileged way. This kind this gives the impression that, you know, we Catholics are on the on the jet to heaven. We ride first class. But Jews like Ben Shapiro or Hindus or Buddhists, they're all riding in coach. We're all getting to the same place, but we get champagne and hot washcloths and nice treatment. We got all the all the amenities of the seven sacraments and they got the coach. Um, I think that's a disservice to to non-Christians and it doesn't properly capture what Catholics have taught about the gospel, the kerygma, salvation for the past 19 years. Hundred years, And then at the very end, I'm going to also show how this distinction that Bishop Barron's making ultimately leads to what we see when we see popes, cardinals, bishops, priests praying with other religions, kissing the Quran, uh, worshiping Pachamama as Mother Earth, etc. It's actually a logical conclusion. All right, so I'm going to run this uh, original clip with Bishop Barron interviewed by Ben Shapiro. And as you listen, I want you to see that Bishop Barron, like many um, modernist, liberal, I mean, he's not liberal like some of our clerics, but he does give what I'm calling here a two-hand offer of salvation, a right-hand offer and a left-hand offer. The right-hand offer is the traditional kerygma of the Catholic Church. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. He's the second person of the Trinity. He was born of the Virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose on the third day, and he offers salvation to all who believe in him. Believe and be baptized. Repent and believe. Die in a state of grace. You will go to heaven through Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, Messiah, Son of God. All right, that's the right-hand offer. But if the person you're talking to is offended by that, if they say, well, you're saying I'm going to hell, I, I don't like that, you then, the modernist, has the left-hand offer. The left-hand offer is this modernist liberal proposal that says to you, follow truth in your own worldview, follow truth in your own religion, as long as it's true, and you will be saved. Alternatively, a variation of it is your conscience is your salvation. If you follow your conscience, your natural conscience, you'll end up at a supernatural destination. So this is the double-handed. Never in the history of the church, if you read Jesus Christ or John the Baptist, you read the 12 apostles, you read uh, apostolic fathers, Ignatius, Polycarp, church fathers, even Justin Martyr, who's, who teaches the seeds of the Logos, doesn't teach salvation through these false belief systems. Okay, so here's the clip. 
with Ben Shapiro. Just cue it up here. And notice that Ben Shapiro actually asked Bishop Barron for the right-hand offer. And you'll see that Bishop Barron switches over to the left-hand offer. Here we go. There shall be. So let's start okay. with the most awkward of the awkward questions. Yeah. I don't really care about this question particularly much, but I get this question a lot, which is, you know, as a Jew, how does it feel that there are other religions that don't think you're getting into heaven? So let me ask you, what's the Catholic view on who gets into heaven and who doesn't? I feel like I lead a pretty good life, a very religiously based life in which I try to keep not just the Ten Commandments, but a solid 603 other commandments as well. And I spend an awful lot of my time promulgating what I would consider to be Judeo-Christian virtues, particularly in Western societies. So what's the Catholic view of me? Am I basically screwed here? No. The Catholic view, go back to uh, the Second Vatican Council, says it very clearly. I mean, Christ is the privileged route to salvation. May God so love the world that gave his only son that we might find eternal life. So that's the, the privileged route. However, Vatican II clearly teaches that someone outside the explicit Christian faith can be saved. Now, they're saved through the grace of Christ, indirectly received. So, I mean, the grace is coming from Christ, but it might be received according to your uh, conscience. So if you're following your conscience sincerely, or in your case, you're following the commandments of the law sincerely, yeah, you can be saved. Now, that doesn't conduce to a complete relativism. I, we still would say the privileged route and, and the, the route that God has, has offered to humanity is, is the route of his son. But no, you can be saved. Uh, even Vatican II says that an atheist of goodwill can be saved because in following his conscience, if he does, John Henry Newman said the conscience is the aboriginal vicar of Christ in the soul. It's very interesting characterization, that it is, in fact, the voice of Christ. If he's the Logos made flesh, right, he's the divine mind or reason made flesh, that when I follow my conscience, I'm following him, whether I know it explicitly or not. So even the atheist, Vatican II teaches, of goodwill can be saved. So is Catholic... Okay, so, so there it is. That's the left-hand offer. Uh, clearly, um, Paul, when he was wrote, writing Romans, Galatians, Hebrews... Uh, particularly to a Jewish audience, on the question of, can I obey the law and be saved? His answer is no. <laughs> and he says, because be, otherwise Christ would have died in vain. That's the argument that's in Galatians. Uh, it's also in Hebrews. So the answer that Bishop Barron is giving to Ben Shapiro here is not the biblical answer. It's not the historic answer. The historic answer would have been, I think, very easy to set forth to Ben Shapiro. It's this. Yes, you're obeying the 603 laws plus the Ten Commandments. That's 613 laws. How are you doing on that? Are you 100% observing the laws? And I think Ben Shapiro, who's an honest guy, would say, no, I try my best. I try my best to obey, but I fail. And then he could have given him the historic kerygma, the gospel, and said, well, Christ is the perfect law keeper. This is all Galatians, Hebrews, and Romans. If you enter into Christ, who is the perfectly observant Jew because he's God, you will receive salvation and become justified. That is, the infusion of God's justice, his righteousness, will be placed in you and you can be saved. And they could have that discussion based on the law, based on Romans, based on Galatians, based on Hebrews. That's not what Bishop Barron did. Bishop Barron went to left-hand offer right away, which is kind of the post, well, not kind of, it is the post-Vatican II presentation of salvation. Now, ask yourself, would Christ have given that answer to any of the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes at, that, at his time? I don't think so. Would St. John Chrysostom ever say that? No. Listen to this quote from the Council of Florence from 1441, an ecumenical council. Quote, The Holy Roman Church firmly believes, professes, and preaches that all those who are outside the Catholic Church, not only pagans, but also Jews, heretics, and schismatics, cannot share an eternal life and will go into the everlasting fire. End quote. This is the kind of quote that Ben Shapiro was asking about. And I think Ben Shapiro is a smart guy and he deserves a smart answer, not the left-hand offer. Listen to this quote from the Syllabus of Errors. This is from Pius IX. Condemned statement. The statement is condemned. You can't believe this. Quote, man may, in observance of any religion whatever, find the way of eternal salvation and arrive at eternal salvation. End quote. That's condemned. That's an error condemned by Pius IX that man in observing any religion 
can find the way of salvation, which is essentially what Bishop Barron just told Ben Shapiro. Now, the main purpose of today's podcast is to actually look at the most recent statement by Bishop Barron. And here is where he talks about the lesser lights and how other religions can contain the reflections or the lesser lights of Christ and that these religions themselves can become the means of salvation to Jesus. So he's not a Bishop Barron is not a relativist. He's smarter than that. He understands Christianity better than that. He's not going to say, well, yeah, Buddha is equal to Jesus. Shiva is, e is equal to Jesus Christ. He's not going to say that. What he is going to say is that their teachings and their system, their philosophy, their religion, since it contains truth, it contains channels, paths that provide grace from Jesus. And that's the distinction that we're honing in on. So in order for you to see this, I'm going to queue up the video here with, with Bishop Barron. This is the second one. And this is him on his recent sermon. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to bring it up here in, in the beginning. ...of Christianity. And here's, here are a few lines that I submit to you are kind of troubling for a lot of people today. Listen. He, Christ, is the stone rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is no salvation through anyone else, nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. Pretty blunt stuff, huh? Pretty exclusive sounding. You know, we put such a premium on non-judgmentalism and inclusivity and everyone gets around the table. Well, here's some pretty uncompromising words. There Yes, it is very uncompromising. And why can't we leave it that way? Why does there now have to be another 11 minutes of explaining how the statement and the claim of St. Peter in Acts 4, you can read the verse right here, why does it have to be watered down? Why can't we just let it sit there and say, yeah, there is no other way to heaven. It's Jesus Christ. Why can't we just let that be? Bishop Barron seems to suggest that we should, but then he, he if you listen to the rest of the video, you're kind of scratching your head. Here he goes. It seems no Jew, no Hindu, no Buddhist, no Muslim, no agnostic, no atheist could possibly be saved that no one gets into heaven except explicit Christians. As I say, it, it um, runs counter to so many of our cultural instincts today. And furthermore, it seems to play into a lot of our worst religious uh, instincts, namely us against them. Wouldn't this give rise, people might say, to a sort of you know, religious violence? We're the in so I've noticed once before Bishop Barron make the same kind of argument. So um, when he was talking to Reuben about whether he would have um, uh, gay marriages repealed, he said, well, I'm not going to jump up on a tank. So he, he, he went to sort of a, um, a visual that's very radical and very violent. And he's kind of as the, as the other option. So I wouldn't want to do that. So no, I wouldn't want to repeal uh, gay marriage laws. So it's the same kind of thing here. Like, well, if we believe in exclusivity, that means that we're going to start killing people in other religions. It's going to lead to violence. Uh, again, that's, that's not a conclusion that follows. Clearly Christ taught this in John 14, six, and he, and Peter taught it in Acts chapter four, and none of them were going around and killing anyone. What were they doing? They were going around preaching the gospel and baptizing people. You see, it, it leads to a missionary impetus, not a violent impetus. All right, a little bit more here. Else is outside. If we have to use violence to bring them in, why not? Hasn't this sort of thing been used up and down the centuries to justify or sanction violence? Okay, as I say, it's a problematic text for a lot of people today. Here's the first move I want to make in helping us to understand it, is to make no move at all. 
<laughs> what I mean here is, I think it's important for us to let the difficulty of this text sink in. I agree. I agree. And I think the answer to that would be to start talking about the ontological solution that God provides in Jesus Christ. That is, we are finite, we are human, God is infinite. Our priest, our redeemer, would have to somehow be fully God and fully man to escort us and to elevate us to the beatific vision, heaven. Hence, we need a God-man, the hypostatic union. All right, that's important. And then also, we're sinners. Original sin, mortal sin, venial sin. We need propitiation, we need a redemption. And so that means that not only does the God-man, is he born of a virgin, he also dies on the cross and he rises again. This is a solution that's unique to Christianity because it provides an ontological, metaphysical solution of, of bringing man to God, what we call theosis, right? Be, being come, as Thomas Aquinas says, deiform through Christ, but also the atonement and the redemption. Jesus Christ dies for our sin. Muhammad dies for nobody. Buddha dies for nobody. Shiva, Ganesh, all these gods and prophets and leaders, no, none of them die for anyone. Christ, as the Son of God, dies for people. And that is the solution. So let's focus on that. Let's not, at this moment, pivot and then talk about how there's exceptions and how there are lesser lights to move around. So I'm going to fast forward here just a touch. And let me get him back on the screen here. Okay, I think it's right about here. It's a lovely little expression. As you look at, at Buddhism or Hinduism or you look at, at Islam or Judaism and other religious philosophies, can we see rays of light? Yeah, elements of, of, of truth and goodness and beauty in them. How should we read those? As participations in the fullness of light found in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Okay, so here this is the this is the pivot that I'm concerned about right there. Okay, so Islam, Buddhism, Hindu, they have these beautiful rays of light in them. And that these rays of lights are participations in the true light who is Jesus Christ. I mean, doesn't Jesus say here in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life? So anything that is true, anything that is life-giving in another religion, aren't we just talking about Jesus inside that religion? This right here, I believe, is the mistake that Bishop Barron's making, and it leads us to dangerous places, as I'll cover at the very end of this video. All right, I'm going, to, I'm going to let Bishop Barron speak in his own words here a little bit more. Here we go. World, quite right. Are there reflections of that light unavailable in other religious traditions and philosophies? And the answer is yes. Now, press it further. Can one find salvation even by means of these lesser lights? And the answer of the Council Fathers is yes. Now, okay. don't write me letters and, and read the Vatican II carefully. I'm See, it's all, about, it's all about appeal to Vatican II. Why can't we appeal to Jesus, the apostles, or earlier councils, like the council I read here of Florence? He's saying there's salvation by means of the lesser lights. You see, so while he began with the proper distinction that Jesus Christ alone is the, is the way, the truth, and the life, he did assert that. His, his slippage has now led him to start saying things like, there can be salvation through other religions by means of the lesser lights. And that really is, I think, the problem um, with the modern bishops, priests, theologians, they're teaching this double-handed message, the double offer of salvation. The real Christian gospel preached by Christ, the apostles, and the church fathers, and then this sort of backup offer. It's like, well, if you don't like that, you can find 
salvation in your other religion. And let me place up here for everyone. I want, I want you to see it. This is the condemned statement from the syllabus of errors. Condemned statement. Man may, in the observance of any religion whatever, find the way of eternal salvation and arrive at eternal salvation. That is condemned. That sounds like what Bishop Barron just said. I don't see the distinction. I think he would say just now, if you're watching, he'd say, yeah, but what I'm saying is, is not just this, but that all the, the observance of those, the truths in those religions are observance of Jesus who is the truth. The problem with that is, is we now have false religions being the vehicles of salvation. Okay, so you can see how this distinction leads us to make statements that don't sound traditionally Catholic. Christ is the privileged way, salvation through lesser light, salvation through the truths of other religions, salvation by means of lesser lights. And there's a three-stage argument of the modernist, and this actually comes from a man who's brilliant, but unfortunately wrong, and that is Karl Rahner. Karl Rahner is, I don't, I don't know if you, po if you pulled every theologian, conservative, liberal, traditional, whatever, and you said, who was the most influential living theologian at Vatican II? probably wouldn't be unanimous 100%, but it would be majority that Karl Rahner and his thought and his thinking is the most influential at the Second Vatican Council. Karl Rahner died in 1984. He was a theologian. He wasn't a bishop, but he was an expert at the Second Vatican Council, and he was really influential on Lumen Gentium, which we'll take a look at, um, and his thought the teaching of anonymous Christianity is basically almost word for word for what Bishop Barron is saying here. So when Bishop Barron went to seminary and became a priest and all that, this is the theology in the modern seminary, in the modern textbooks, is Karl Rahner. Karl Rahner is the bedrock for Vatican II theology. Um, even conservatives, you'd be surprised, even conservatives like Karl Rahner. Karl Rahner is not an idiot. Karl Rahner is very smart. Karl Rahner has read all the councils in Latin. Uh, he knows all that stuff backwards and front. And so he's not going to say something heretically outright. He'll say it very subtly. All right. He, he knows how to, to couch things. And that's, I think, really the, the, the problem we have in our time is that there's so much ambiguity that we start off saying the right stuff, but somehow in our application in Catholicism, it gets way off, way off. Okay, so here is the, the three to four stage argument of the modernist based on the distinction of Karl Rahner. Stage one, stage one, ready? All religions have elements of truth in it. I think everybody agrees with this. For example, the Quran says that Mary is sinful, sinless. That's true. The Quran says that Jesus Christ is sinless. That's also true. The Quran says that Jesus is the Messiah. That is also true. There are three truths I just gave you all from the Quran that reflect upon our Lord Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary. True, true, true. Roman paganism has some truth in it. Does it not teach that Zeus is the greatest God and that Zeus controls the weather? Yes. And if you read the Psalm, Psalm 134, 7, it says, God brings up the clouds from the end of the earth. He had made lightnings for the rain. He brings forth wind. So the same kind of language used for Zeus is used for God. That's true. What about Pachamama? Amazonian religion. The Pachamama symbolizes life, fertility, love, childbearing, newness of life, nature, and the earth being healthy and thriving. Those are seven values that Catholics also respect and celebrate and promote. 
Therefore, we should revere and honor Pachamama. No, not necessarily. Hold up, hold up. So we recognize that there are truths in other religions. Think about when Satan tempted Christ in the desert. Three times Satan tempted Christ. And he always quoted scripture when he tempted Christ. The devil doesn't speak pure 100% lies. The devil mixes in truth. Of course, other religions have truth statements in them. Judaism has the entire Old Testament. Well, minus the Deut Deuterocanonicals. That's all true. The problem is, with rabbinical Judaism, is it says Christ was a false prophet and a failed Messiah. False. <laughs> right? Okay, so the first stage is simply, this is the Karl Rahner system, is to say all religions have truth on it. Now, stage two is what I call the Karl Rahner leap. This is the leap that I won't make. As a traditional Catholic, I can't follow Karl Rahner here. Bishop Barron does follow Karl Rahner here. And I'm going to try to convince you today to not follow Karl Rahner here. The Karl Rahner jump, the Karl Rahner leap is this. Jesus is the truth, says so in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So anyone following truth in their non-Christian religion, philosophy, or tradition is in fact following Jesus because Jesus is the truth and they're following truth in their religion. Therefore, they are pursuing Jesus and salvation. This is the Karl Rahner jump, the Karl Rahner leap. I don't accept it. Now, here's another quote from Karl Rahner. He says, non-Christians, this is his doctrine of anonymous Christians, could quote, in basic orientation and fundamental decision, accept the salvific grace of God through Christ, although they may have never heard of the Christian revelation. And the way that they're getting their grace is through the truths in their religions. That's the Karl Rahner leap that I won't make and I don't think you should make. Because if you do make that leap with Karl Rahner, you're now going to move on to stage three. And stage three is what we're hearing Bishop Barron say with Shapiro and in this latest sermon. Stage three is you then tell people in other religions, you're okay. You're fine. If you don't want to convert to Jesus Christ, repent and believe in Jesus, just follow the truth in your own religion and you will be saved. All right, this is what we see after Vatican II. It's derived, I don't want to get into debate of whether this is a um, proper conclusion from Lumen Gentium, specifically section 16, but this is the Bishop Barron level of modernism and the modern proclamation of what Christianity is about. Yes, we believe Jesus is the God-man, that he died for our sins, he rose from the third day, we realize you might find that uncomfortable or not accept it. And so therefore we say you're also okay to follow your own truths in your religions because all truths is Jesus. So ultimately you're following Jesus. That's the Karl Rahner leap. Now, then there's a stage four. And this is, this is the final point. I don't believe Bishop Barron goes to stage four, but I do believe that Pope Francis and even John Paul II went to stage four. It is the most, um, it is the logical conclusion. It's the final output of the Karl Rahner argument. Stage four is, since we Catholics celebrate, revere, and promote the means of grace. So, for example, what are means of grace for us? Well, baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, uh, matrimony, holy orders, um, the sign of the cross, holy water, um, the Bible. All these are means of grace for Catholics, and we Catholics always celebrate, revere, and promote the means of grace. So stage four is, since other religions have become the means of grace for non-Catholics, we Catholics should also celebrate and revere and promote the other religions. Why? Because they also have become means of grace. The Quran, according to this way of thinking, has truth in it. 
It has true statements. Mary is sinless. Jesus is the Messiah. That's in the Quran. Those are true statements. We like them. Therefore, we revere, celebrate, and promote Islam because of those truth statements. And that right there leads you to some of the madness that we see in our time period. I'm going to make you feel a little uncomfortable, but here's the picture of John Paul II kissing the Quran. It really did happen. It's not a Chaldean book of the Gospels. Why is John Paul II doing that? He seems so conservative. He was against communism. John Paul II has followed the argument of Karl Rahner. Stage one, there is truth in other religions. Stage two, all truth is Jesus. So therefore, they're pursuing Jesus and his grace. Stage three, tell other religions and promote other religions. And then stage four, honor what is true in those religions. So I bet if you ask John Paul II, if you asked him, why did you kiss the Quran? He's like, well, I wasn't kissing the whole Quran. I was kissing the truth that is in the Quran. That's stage four. Similarly, we have the Assisi meetings. So, you know, John Paul getting together and there being prayer held in common with other religions, prayers for peace, even the Native Americans smoking their peace pipes, even the Dalai Lama placing a Buddha statue on top of an altar in Assisi. Yes, it really happened. I document it. It was documented in the New York Times. I give you the footnotes in the infiltration. The Dalai Lama put an idol of Buddha on top of a Catholic tabernacle, a Catholic altar in the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi. That's the picture of it right there. Lots of people saw it. This is now Catholics moving to stage four saying, we, we not only recognize truths in your religion, we're now honoring and promoting your religion. In our own time, we saw it with the Pacamama, the Pachamama. Worship veneration of a Mother Earth idol from the Amazonian region in the Vatican Gardens, and then ultimately in the Church of St. Mary, and then in the Vatican itself. I'm not trying to scandalize you. I'm trying to show where these ideas lead. Again, I don't think Bishop Barron has ever worshipped a Pachamama, has ever kissed a Quran, but I would ask Bishop Barron. I guess this would be my only... Um, yeah, my only question, Bishop Barron, would you kiss a Quran? Since there is lesser lights, lesser there are truths and lesser lights in the Quran, would you kiss a Quran? And would you venerate a Pachamama? Because again, Pachamama, it it represents um, life, fertility, childbearing, the health of the earth, all these positive things that we Catholics also revere. Would you then kiss or venerate? or kneel before Pacamama. Because if, if what you're saying is true, Bishop Barron, if what you're saying is that salvation can be acquired by means of these religions, then we should be venerating those means. In other words, they become not sacraments, but they become in a way sacramentals or quasi-sacramentals. That means they deserve our reverence. I'm going to show you a, a really extreme example of where this theology takes us. This was more recently. This is people bringing in an idol of Ganesh. Ganesh is the um, elephant head god of Hinduism. Check this out. So this is a Catholic church. And they're bringing in this idol into a Catholic church. People did get in trouble for this. So we, we can't have this going on. But the people who organized this, they had the same idea. Hinduism contains the lesser lights. We should honor those lesser lights with these people. This is what's getting us off track in Catholicism in 2021. I understand what Karl Rahner is trying to accomplish. I understand what Bishop Barron is trying to accomplish. Bishop Barron, you have to hand it to him. He's done an excellent job of getting into the public eye. 
he is engaging culture. He engages culture better than any bishop I know. He's being interviewed by the right people, Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro and Ruben. He's at Google. He's at Facebook. He is getting in front of the right people. The problem is, is that he gives the double, the two-handed offer of salvation. And when he's doing a YouTube video to his Catholic audience, it's the right-hand offer. But when he's in these uncomfortable situations, and I got to admit, I would be uncomfortable too if I'm in on these big media platforms and you're asked point blank by Ben Shapiro, am I screwed as a Jew? I got it. We all have to admit that we would be uncomfortable. But we, I don't think we should be offering that left-hand vision. I think it makes... I think it makes it too easy for us. It makes it too easy for them. Let's give them the John 14, 6 and the Acts 4. If someone asks us a question about Christianity, let's give them the answer of Christ. Bishop Barron says, well, let's go back to the teaching of Vatican II. The teaching of Vatican II was 1965. I think Ben Shapiro deserves words from the master. That old school religion right there from the pages of sacred scripture from the mouth of the logos himself does it make us squirm yes would it make ben shapiro squirm yes does it make us realize that we might be sidelined embarrassed ridiculed yes that's what christ promised us the world would hate us People are going to misunderstand us. People are going to hate. Remember, the early Christians, they weren't required to join another religion. They were required to take one pinch of incense before usually a statue of the emperor, not even Zeus. They could have said, well, he's my emperor. I'm just going to honor him as my civic leader. And he does some good. He paved some nice roads through town here. He built a, a nice stadium. He brought in some aqueducts. So when I offer the incense to his statue, I'm offering incense to the goodness, the lesser lights in that pagan emperor. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do that. But no martyr ever did that. They always said, Christ is king. Christos Curios, Christ is Lord. Christos Curios, Christos Curios. That's what the martyrs said before they died. Well, I think we have got to the end of it. I think we've seen that the syllabus of errors condemns, as it says, quote, the observance of any religion whatsoever that one might find a way of eternal salvation in it. That's condemned. And of course, this also has applications to liturgy. If you believe, ultimately, that man's experience of truth, wherever he finds it, is him finding Jesus and leading him to eternal salvation, your worship is going to change. It's going to be more human-based. Man's experience will become more important than being Christ-centered. This is why the liturgy also changed after the 1960s into the 1970s. If you accept the Ronarian jump, mixing paganism with Christianity and making worship more communal, more circular, more round, the priest speaks over the altar to the people instead of being ad orientum, all of these things begin to make sense. It actually is a, a unit that goes together. So, in conclusion, what do you do? What do you do? Well, I think it's important that we read the Bible every day. That changes your worldview. Read the Bible. Everybody should read the Bible from Genesis to Apocalypse. Everybody. I have a plan that's totally free. It's the how to read the Catholic Bible in one year. I give you day by day which books to read so that you finish it in 365 days. It's totally free. It's the read the Bible in a year plan. There are other plans as well. Father Mike Schmidt's going through it as well. I've listened to some of that so far. Awesome. Good. Um, we also need to be praying the rosary every day. If you don't pray the rosary every day, you're not on the team. 
we need to pray the rosary because the rosary reminds us that the means of salvation is Jesus Christ and Christ came to us how? How did we come to know the second person in Trinity? Through the motherhood, through the womb of the Virgin Mary. She says, do whatever he tells you to do. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. What's so important about Our Lady is she roots salvation in history, right? It's not just about, oh, here's a fortune cookie truth in Buddhism, a fortune cookie truth in Islam, a fortune cookie truth in, in Hinduism. She shows that God broke into time through her. She consented, let it be done unto me. And the God-man dwelled in her. He was born. He lived a perfect life. He died. He rose again. He gave us the Holy Ghost. These are the mysteries of the rosary. This is why you pray the rosary every day. You're not on the team. This is why Our Lady of Fatima, when she saw all the dangers coming into the church, the beginning of the 1900s, what was her solution? Consecrate Russia. Pray the rosary daily and do the first Saturday's devotion. Let's just do it. See what happens. Let's trust mom. Let's trust mom. All right. Well, we're going to close here. We'll pray the Hail Mary in Latin. Oremus. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or nobis peccatoribus, Nunca de tora mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. I think just a final word um, for for Bishop Barron and for people who like Bishop Barron is Bishop Barron is talented, he's smart, and he has an enormous reach. And I think if we could just in, adjust that Carl Rahner leap, that Carl Rahner jump, we could fix that. We would have the apostle of our times. We would have the bishop of the internet. And I think it's important that we always offer the right hand presentation of the gospel. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He died on the cross for us. He rose again for our justification. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No other name, no other way. Everybody, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please hit the like button and give this video a thumbs up. Please also um, subscribe and um, hit the bell. There's a little notification bell. Please hit that. And what did I say? Oh, share it. Please share this video on Facebook, Twitter, Parler, wherever you uh, do your social media. Please use the little share button that's beneath this video and share it around there. And then also to all the Patreons who support this channel and this show and this work, I do thank you. If you want to become a Patreon and receive some signed books, or right now I'm doing a, a giveaway for a Father Lassant's traditional Latin Mass Missal, also the multi-volume Latin and English edition of Thomas Aquinas and the Summa Theologia, a bunch of other things, all that's going on at Patreon. Also files if you want to listen to the Bible and Church Fathers you want to get a hold of any of those things, please learn more at patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. All right, friends, thanks so much for watching. And remember, our Lord Jesus Christ said you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless and Godspeed. Christ is risen.